The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 A campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's OK. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. 26. OK, good. And are you a student, teacher or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? OK, well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's OK. It's $20,000 a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day on average do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot really. I'd say just over an hour all told. Now you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions 5 to 10. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later, after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programmes do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programmes would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news. So I'd like to see programmes about local information, you know, providing a service to the campus community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers, you know, some lectures or relevant programmes. Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new director some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too, you know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now, this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think, well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. 
Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to, as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. Okay, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not, except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. Okay, can I have your name and address? Of course, I have a card I can give you. Oh, great! And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure.、Mm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a talk about attending a science festival. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Now I think nearly all of you have received confirmation of your school placements for next term, and as part of your activities, we will be asking you to take responsibility for promoting a school visit to the Norchester Science Festival. Of course, the head of science at your school will be aware of the festival and should have all the details of it. But all the heads of science at your schools will be looking to you to be the main organizer and motivator of a visit to the festival. They'll give you the documents you need. We hope that you will motivate pupils at your schools to take an interest in the festival. It runs for three days. There are day tickets and special three-day tickets, and schools have the extra option of a two-day ticket. We hope you will encourage your pupils to visit it on one or two days, but most important of all, we hope you will use the festival to generate a lively interest in science that will last all year round, and provide the school with a lasting benefit. This will, with luck, lead to improved examination results in science subjects, and let's not forget, we hope your pupils will have a lot of fun too. Needless to say, your performance in achieving these aims will count towards your final exam grade at the end of the year. Now, let me just say a few words on why a science festival. Science is part of our everyday world in a way that is different now from before. Of course, we are used to having the benefit of scientific inventions. We are used to the aeroplane, the motor car, the space rocket, and so on. But now we live in a truly scientific age, which means one where inventions and improvements are matters of routine, rather than occasional and unusual events. We have become a really scientific society. Yet we find that we are failing to interest and enthuse the young in this. Fewer young people are choosing to study science at school after the age of sixteen. And even fewer at university. As a result, we have fewer teachers coming into schools to teach science, and many science teachers are not teaching their specialism. For example, I know of several cases where maths is being taught by biologists, and chemistry is being taught by physicists. We urgently need another three thousand science teachers in England at least. That's why we look to you, the science teachers who are starting off your careers, 
to inject enthusiasm and wonder into the study of science, and we hope the Norchester Festival will help you to do this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, enough of the background. What about the festival? There are three main venues where the festival events take place. These are the Millennium Library, the Town Hall, not the Town Hall itself, but the Town Hall Conference Centre, and the Norchester Theatre. Now, when you are planning your visits, Remember that many of the activities for younger pupils will be at the Millennium Library and the secondary school pupils may find more to interest them in the Conference Centre. Now, just so that you have some immediate information, I'd like to mention a few of the events that are taking place this year. One event of special interest to people living in this area is called Waterworld. This is a clay model of the southeast of England and the presenters show you the effects of rising sea levels as a result of climate change. They ask the audience to select the rise in sea level, for example, 20 or 40 or 60 centimetres, and the model shows the places that would be flooded as a result. Watch out for your town. Does it sink or does it swim? Transport 2050 is about transport options for our towns in the future. A number of experts will introduce the topic and then everyone at the event will have a chance to speak and give their views. Science in a Suitcase is a comedy act by two scientists who do crazy experiments and sing songs and play the clown to large audiences every afternoon. I'm particularly looking forward to that one, which should be entertaining. Ropes and Hangings is an interactive event which will be of interest to young people in which, after experimenting with ropes and bricks, they build a real suspension bridge. That kind of hands-on activity is always really popular. And, appealing to a different audience, there is Paper and Time, in which some experts will be showing us the techniques they use for the conservation of ancient books and manuscripts. This will obviously not be for everybody, but it should be interesting just to see how they do it. Now, let's move on to tickets and transport to the festival. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25.
But what would you say, Mr. Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanization due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which, in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle. And whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr. Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown, it's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr. Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Gorillas, tigers, leopards, and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns, and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death, at so much ahead on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray. We do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony. But we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr. Murray. But I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that, or the other in the most effective way, at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out, not to say leaks out. And by that time, it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which. Though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. 
Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat and consequently our own systems, they'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. Today we'll be hearing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world: water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety. Because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways, I'd become interested through reports on radio about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends, and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject, and all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound. That some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So, what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men. Who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first? So you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and oh, sorry, no, it was women, who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot.
Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.